the seminar of the Center for uh, Institutional Studies at the HSC University in Moscow. We are very pleased to have as our speaker tonight, Anastasia Terskaya. She is a professor of School of Economics and Business, University of Navarra in Spain. Uh, Anastasia's degrees are from the University of Alicante, also Spain, and also from Moscow State University of Economics, Statistics and Information. Anastasia does labor health, uh, household economics. And uh, tonight she's going to talk about the effects of unearned wealth on marital and fertility outcomes. Anastasia. Thank you so much, uh, Leonid, for presenting me, and thank you so much for inviting me for this seminar. Um, so let me try to share my screen. Can you see my slides now? Yes, we can. Yes. Let me try to make it full screen, just a second. Okay. All right. So again, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's a very big pleasure and uh, it's, it's a pity that I could not visit the uh, Higher School of Economics in person. Uh, but anyways, uh, let me start the presentation. So I'm going to present the paper, The Effects of Unearned Wealth on Marital and Fertility Outcomes. Uh, this uh, joint work with uh, David Cesarini from uh, New York University with Eric Lindquist from Stockholm University and with Robert Ostling from Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, so this is a work in progress, something on which I'm working currently. So all your comments and uh, uh, questions are very welcome. Uh, so in this paper, uh, we estimate the effect of uh, wealth shock on fertility, uh, on marriage formation and marriage dissolution. And uh, we try to make a substantial progress in uh, identifying causal relationship uh, between these outcomes uh, by relying on randomized assignment of lottery prices in a large administrative data set of Swedish lottery players. Uh, so basically in this work, we are going to compare uh, fertility, marriage and uh, divorce outcomes between winners of large prices and winners of small prices. And we also observe uh, uh, all the characteristics um, of players, like how many tickets they bought, uh, in which draw they played. So uh, we are quite sure that the assignment of these prizes is as good as random. And therefore, uh, our results can be interpreted as causal. Uh, also, we match uh, the players, the sample of players, uh, to their administrative records. Uh, and therefore, we can also estimate uh, uh, long run effects of, uh, of lottery uh, on, on these outcomes. So let me um, summarize uh, the results before I move to the introduction. So uh, we have found that for marriages, um, higher wealth implies uh, an increase in marriage probability uh, among males. Uh, and we did not find any significant effect for uh, among women. Um, for divorces, we also found some interest in gender heterogeneity. So it seems that uh, when the winner is a wife, uh, in these couples, uh, higher wealth implies uh, a higher probability of, uh, um, of marriage dissolution in the short run. So two years after the lottery. And in couples, in the couples, uh, where the winner is a husband, uh, the effect is, uh, is the opposite. So it seems that higher wealth implies lower uh, marriage dissolution probability. And for fertility, we found that uh, higher wealth uh, for men implies uh, also higher, uh, higher fertility. So the number of children increases uh, two, five, and 10 years after the lottery. And there is no significant effect uh, for women. So you may ask, why do we care in estimating uh, the wealth effect on uh, outcomes that are sometimes thought to lie outside the scope of economics, uh, such as marriage formation and marriage dissolution? So basically here, uh, researchers and policymakers might be interested in 
uh, in understanding whether income transfers or uh, some uh, subsidies may have unintended effects on marriage uh, formation or marriage dissolution or uh, on the number of children. So for example, uh, income transfers to low income households may lead to fertility increases. And as a result, uh, it may offset some of the benefits of the program in terms of uh, alleviating poverty. So I see something in, in the chat. I'm not sure if someone has some problems. No, please don't pay attention to the chat because it's just people like uh, registering. And if oh, right, there are any right, questions, right. I will just let you know. So don't worry. Oh, all right, all right, all right. OK, so I'm not putting any attention on the chat. All right, so another example um, can be that policymakers that are interested in uh, gender equality or, or female empowerment may take into account that income transfers to financially dependent uh, women may allow them uh, to exit unhappy marriages. So, okay, so, sorry, for some reason I cannot change the slide. Sorry, just a second. Yeah. Okay. Uh, regarding uh, theoretical predictions about the effect of wealth on marriage uh, formation and divorce. So the theoretical effects of income or wealth shocks on marriages and divorce rates uh, are ambiguous. Uh, so uh, Baker and co-authors um, in, in his seminal paper in 1977 um, argues that um, people continue to be married um, until uh, the utility of, uh, of being married uh, offsets the utility of being single. So in this case, higher resources uh, may have a stabilizing effect because it may relax arguments that lead to divorce, some arguments uh, because of financial, uh, financial problems, for instance. Um, also, higher resources may enable unhappy couples to, to uh, incur the costs associated with divorce. Uh, so these effects can be seen as uh, economic independence effect, uh, so higher resources are outside uh, the marriage may enable uh, some people to, uh, to get divorced. Um, then higher resources provided to single individuals may make these individuals more attractive as marriage partners, but also uh, higher resources may make single life more attractive, and therefore it's not really clear uh, which effect offsets, um, offsets which effect, and therefore it's not really clear whether higher resources would lead to higher marriage rates or not. Uh, also, uh, another possible mechanism is that uh, higher resources may cover marriage expenses, which are uh, estimated to be quite high, and therefore um, wealth shocks may lead, to, uh, may lead to more marriages as well. Uh, and empirical evidence is also mixed. So regarding um, fertility, the theoretical predictions are more clear. So um, in his seminal uh, paper, uh, Baker introduced children in economics as normal goods, normal durable goods. So it may not sound, sound really nice, but it's uh, just economic uh, terminology. Um, so basically, uh, this assumption is made because children have a few substitutes. And for that reason, we may expect that higher wealth uh, would increase number of children because they are normal goods. Uh, but the empirical evidence was largely inconsistent with this assumption. So for example, cross-country data and time series data suggests that uh, GDP and fertility are negatively correlated. For instance, um, if you look at uh, fertility rate, so number of children per woman, in some European countries and in Nordic countries, so here um, I depicted this plot for Nordic countries because we are looking at Sweden. So you can see that uh, in developed countries, uh, um, fertility rates uh, were declining, which uh, which was associated with economic growth. So um, it's a little bit uh, counterintuitive. 
Uh, and potential solutions to this puzzle is that this negative correlation, negative uh, cross country uh, and, fertility, uh, and time series correlation uh, doesn't reflect the causal relationship. So there might be uh, other factors uh, that explain this relationship, uh, not necessarily uh, income. Um, and in order to estimate a causal relationship, exogenous variation in income and wealth is required. And this variation is quite rare in observational data. So another potential solution to this puzzle, puzzle is basically even if we find this exogenous variation in wages, so we estimate causal effect of wages on uh, fertility, for example, um, this effect still might be biased, might not reflect uh, the income effect, uh, because higher wages also imply higher cost of having children, because higher wages uh, increase the opportunity cost of time. So for that reason, uh, higher earned income might be negatively associated with, uh, uh, with uh, fertility. Uh, and another, another explanation also proposed by Baker in his seminal work is that there is quality quantity trade-off. So um, when parents get higher wages, they may try to invest more in their children. So therefore they invest more in quality of children, which increases uh, a cost of having additional child. And therefore, uh, as a result, they, they may decide to have less children. So in our paper, since we uh, use uh, as good as random variation in unearned wealth, we circumvent these uh, two uh, first bullet points. So um, our results, first of all, can be interpreted as causal. And second, uh, since we are, we are using unearned wealth, so lottery, it, it's just pure luck. Uh, of course, it doesn't affect the opportunity cost of time. And therefore, um, the, the effect can be interpreted as pure income effect. So uh, in the past uh, uh, decade, um, in the past decade, uh, uh, there, there was made a substantial progress in identifying uh, causal effect of, of wealth and income shocks on family outcomes. Uh, so some papers uh, uh, used variation in job displacement, in commodity price fluctuation, in changes uh, in income or income taxes, or in welfare system reforms. Uh, so, uh, for instance, job displacement, the results um, uh, from papers that use job displacement, uh, we can argue that these uh, results cannot really be interpreted as uh, pure income effect because job displacement affects uh, uh, income, earned income, and therefore uh, it may affect uh, uh, fertility outcomes or marital outcomes, not only because of the income effect, but also because of the uh, cost of opportunity effect. Uh, and similarly, for instance, um, um, welfare system reforms or income taxes um, it may affect fertility or marital outcomes, not only because of the income effect, but also because these reforms may provide some additional incentives to change marital status or uh, to have less or more children. So, for example, um, some of these papers, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Rosenweit and co-authors, uh, they looked at the effect of, uh, uh, of the reform, which provided income transfers to single mothers. So clearly, uh, this reform uh, not only increased the resources of single mothers, but also provided uh, some additional incentives uh, to have more children and to get divorced, right? So for that reason, this type of, uh, of variation can be interpreted as causal, but it, it doesn't reflect uh, only the income effect. It also has some other uh, effects. And uh, in order to estimate the income effect, variation in unearned wealth is uh, required. So exogenous variation in unearned wealth is required. So these papers are the closest to our paper. 
So, for instance, one of the papers that used variation in unearned wealth is the paper of Lovenheim and Mumford, 2013, uh, which used uh, variation in housing prices. So they, um, they looked at uh, exogenous variation in housing prices in the US and how it affects uh, fertility. And they found that there is positive association between um, housing wealth and fertility. Uh, then another paper is the paper of Blackley and Ferry, which is a very nice paper that uses historical data uh, from the uh, US from 19th century. Um, and they use data on land lottery winners. Um, so uh, this paper also estimates the effect on the number of children, but mainly this paper focuses on uh, children's, uh, children's uh, human capital outcomes. And they found that there is a small uh, positive effect uh, of land on the number of children, but that there is no effect on children's human capital outcomes. Uh, and another example is the paper of uh, Hankins and Huestra that also uses uh, uh, lottery data from Florida, and they look at a short-run marital and uh, uh, divorce outcomes. So in our paper, what we add to the previous literature is, first of all, uh, the quality of data that we have uh, allows us to classify players into group within which the price amount was randomly assigned. So we have really rich data, um, which includes uh, the information on the number of tickets that players had, on the draw in which they played, on uh, the account balance, um, on their bank accounts that they had, and so on. So basically, uh, we can compare players who played in the same draw, who played exactly the same lottery, uh, who played under the same rules, and the, this variation is therefore as good as random, and also who had the same number of tickets. Um, another advantage of our paper is that uh, we have really a large price pool. So we have our, uh, the total price pool constitutes uh, about 265 million US dollars, which allows us to estimate the effect with high precision. Another advantage which adds uh, to the previous literature is that we can match uh, the sample of lottery players to their administrative records and we follow them up to 10 years after the lottery. So therefore, uh, we can provide short, medium and long run effects uh, of the lottery on, uh, on the outcomes in which we are interested. Uh, instead, for instance, uh, previous papers, the paper of Lovenheim uh, and Mumford and the paper of Hankins and Huestra, they looked at the effects uh, uh, four and three years after the event, so medium run effects. And another advantage of our paper is that the interpretation is straightforward because we are looking at the effect of monetary wealth. So it's, um, it's easy to, uh, to use this wealth. So let me, let me move to the data section and let me describe the data that, that, we, that we have. So uh, the data that we are using in this paper is uh, the same data that, were, what, uh, that was used by my co-authors in their previous works. Uh, so uh, in one paper, they estimated the effect uh, of uh, lottery wealth on, um, on health outcomes and on children's outcomes. Uh, and in another paper, they looked at the effect on, um, on individual and household labor supply. And uh, also they looked at the effect on subjective well-being. So here we are using the same data. And uh, this data consists, um, consists on three lottery samples. So first lottery is Combi lottery. So Combi is a monthly subscription lottery. So basically subscribers choose their desired number of tickets and they are built monthly. Um, and we have information on, uh, on, on prizes um, of all winners who won more than 1 million Swedish crowns. So the rules of this lottery are very simple. So basically players who played in the same draw and had the same number of tickets have 
the same probability of getting a large, of winning a large prize. And therefore, for this lottery, we are going to compare players who played in the same draw and had the same number of tickets. So we are going to compare large prize winners to non-winners. So uh, for each large prize winner, uh, we match uh, 200 non-winners. Then the second sample is trees lottery. So trees is a scratch uh, ticket lottery. So basically players just need to draw a ticket and there are two types of prizes. One is lump sum prize. So basically in, in this case, a player just need to draw one, one ticket uh, and uh, the price ranges from about uh, uh, 7,000 US dollars to, uh, to about 70,000 US dollars. And another type of price is monthly installment. So in this case, a player has to draw two independent tickets, one for the amount of the price of the installment and another for the duration of installment. So here, the amount of, of installment ranges from about 14,000, oh, sorry, 1,400 to about uh, 1,700 US dollars. And the duration ranges from about 10 to 50 years. So basically, if you got a large price here, you got like a salary for 50, for, for 50 years. Uh, and here, the rules of this lottery are also very simple. Individuals who won, uh, who played in the same draw, so in the same year, under the same price plan, has the same have the same probability of winning a large prize. And for three lottery, we do not have information about non-winners. We have only information about winners. So we compare uh, winners of small prizes to winners of large prizes uh, who played in the same year under the same price plan. So the third sample uh, are individuals who hold uh, price link saving accounts. So here for each uh, 100 Swedish crowns in account balance, uh, individual has one ticket. So basically if you have a lot of money in your bank account, you have more tickets and the probability of winning uh, is higher. Uh, so there were two types of prizes that one could win in this lottery. So first is fixed price. Uh, fixed price is independent of, on the, of the account balance. So therefore individuals who played, um, who played in the same draw and won the same number of tickets uh, had the same probability of winning a large price. For that reason, for fixed prizes, we are going to compare uh, players who, who played in the same draw and had the same, won the same number of prizes. And another possibility is odds price. So here odds price was a multiple of one, 10 or 100 times the account balance. It was capped at 1 million Swedish crowns. So therefore for odds prizes, the amount uh, won is not independent uh, on the account balance. And we compare players who had similar account balance, who won the same number of tickets the same number of prizes and who played in the same draw. So this table shows you the distribution of prizes uh, for each lottery and in our pooled sample. So first of all, you can see that um, the, the most observations come from PLS lottery. So from uh, price link saving, saving accounts and uh, there are also a lot of small prize winners among these PLS, uh, PLS players. Um, so the uh, big prize winners are mainly distributed among uh, three slot three players. So you can see that there are some individuals who won more than 5 million Swedish crowns. By the way, 1 million Swedish crowns is about 140,000 uh, US dollars. So it's quite, it's quite a lot. Um, for that reason, uh, the, the biggest share of our identification variation comes from these three uh, lottery winners. Uh, although the sample size for this lottery is uh, smaller. 
So let me describe our main outcomes and the estimation sample. So uh, we restrict the sample to individuals between 18 and 44 years, years old uh, at the moment of win. So this is done because we are looking at fertility outcomes. So we do not want it, uh, we don't want to include individuals uh, who completed their fertility. Uh, then we also uh, look at, um, at outcomes two, five, and 10 years after the lottery. So our main outcomes are the following. Uh, marriage formation, which is a dummy variable uh, that takes uh, a value one. If an individual got uh, married within T years after the lottery. And here we include only pre-lottery unmarried uh, individuals. Uh, so marriage dissolution is a, a, another outcome which takes a value one if individual got divorced within T years after the lottery. And here we include only pre-lottery married individuals. Um, and finally, fertility, which is the total number of post-lottery children born uh, within T years after the lottery. So as a result, we are going to have three outcomes analyzed in three different time horizons. So therefore nine outcomes, and we are going to estimate our main regression uh, in a pooled sample. So in the sample uh, of uh, women and men, and men together uh, in a sample of men only and in a sample uh, of women only. So we are going to have 27 regressions. So let me move to the identification strategy. So for each T, so uh, T is two, five, and 10 years after the lottery, we estimate the following model. So here we regress uh, the outcome of interest of individual uh, I measured T years after the lottery. Uh, we regress it on the lottery price. Uh, so here beta t would be our main coefficient of interest. Uh, then on group uh, identifiers, so that we compare individuals who played in the same draw, the same lottery, and so on. So these are fixed effects. Uh, and, and on the vector of pre-lottery characteristics. Uh, so uh, strictly speaking, we don't really need to control for pre-lottery characteristics because we know that uh, the lottery was uh, the lottery prizes were assigned as good as randomly, but uh, we included in order to reduce uh, uh, standard errors. And here we control for age, gender, uh, being Nordic born, uh, having college education before the lottery, being married before the lottery, and um, we also control for the number of children before the lottery. So also I'm going to compare these estimated wealth effects, so this causal effect effects to income gradients. So here by income gradients, I just mean the association between uh, average annual disposable income and uh, the same outcomes, so that we can see whether correlation um, observed in, in, the, in our data between income and uh, marital formation, marriage dissolution, and fertility is similar uh, to the causal uh, estimates. So uh, some, uh, some things about um, in inference and internal validity of, uh, of our results. Uh, so uh, throughout the paper, we report uh, uh, two sets of p-values. Uh, the first are conventional p-values, which are derived from analytical standard errors. Uh, that have been clustered at the individual level. And uh, second, we report uh, permutation-based p-values. So permutation-based p-values are constructed by simulating the distribution of uh, uh, the relevant test, test statistic uh, under the null hypothesis that the treatment effect is zero. So this is, this is similar exercise to the placebo tests. So for each regression, we, ra we run uh, about 1,000 simulation. Um, and from there, we can obtain this uh, simulated distribution of uh, uh, test statistic and compute the p-values. Then, as I said, we have 
three outcomes measured in three time periods uh, and in three different samples. So pooled sample, uh, males and females. So therefore we end up having 27 regressions. And uh, this, um, therefore we have this multiple, uh, multiple hypothesis uh, testing problem, right? Because uh, when we, when we uh, estimate 27 regressions, uh, the probability of getting type one error, so false, uh, false significant results uh, is uh, higher. Right? So for that reason, in our regressions, we control for false discovery rate. So I'm going to show you that um, in some cases, the p-values, even though they are significant, they are not significant after correcting for this false discovery rate. Okay, so regarding internal validity of our uh, results, we check whether the price amount is independent of pre-lottery characteristics conditional on uh, group identifiers. So here in this table, you can see that if you look at these p-values, you can see that uh, pre-lottery baseline characteristics, which include age, college education, number of children, um, marital status, and so on, um, are not statistically, are not significantly, um, are not significantly uh, correlated with the amount uh, of the price when we control for group identifiers. So in here in this uh, pooled sample, you can see that there is no, no significant association between uh, these covariates and uh, the price. Um, and in fact, when we do not include group identifiers, uh, this association is significant. So for that reason, it's really important to compare players who played under the same rules and so on. So an important concern about lottery studies is that lottery players may, may not be representative of the general population. Uh, so for instance, there is some evidence that lottery players are older than general population, that lottery players are more likely to be poorer than general population and so on. And this raises concerns about external validity. Uh, so first of all, what we checked is that uh, lottery winners, uh, our lottery sample, is not uh, really different in terms of uh, uh, observed characteristics from the representative sample. So here we corrected for differences in uh, age and in gender because lottery players are more are likely to be older than representative sample. For that reason, we reweighted uh, the representative sample to match uh, age distribution of the lottery sample and gender distribution of the lottery sample. So you can see that after this reweighting, um, there are some differences in, for instance, in the probability to be Nordic born. So um, lottery players are a little bit more likely to be uh, Nordic born than representative individuals. Uh, they have slightly less children on average uh, than representative individuals, and they are a little bit more likely to, to be college educated. This difference, you can see that these differences are, um, are fairly small. For that reason, we are not really concerned about it. Then also previous evidence um, suggested that uh, lottery winners do not spend their, their entire wealth uh, immediately after winning the lottery. And in fact, previous works of my co-authors, which are based on the same data as this paper, uh, have shown that wealth uh, dis uh, dissipates slowly with time since winning the lottery. So basically it suggests that uh, lottery players do not spend the, 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 their wealth immediately after winning the lottery. So now let me move to the results. Let me show you our main results. Um, so this uh, table shows you, uh, this figure shows you our main results. So the first panel are uh, lottery effects on marriage formation, so on the probability to get married for unmarried individuals. Second panel shows you the results for marriage dissolution, uh, so uh, for the probability to get divorced for married individuals. And last panel shows you the results for fertility. So for marriage formation, um, so this x-axis shows you 
years since the event, so years since the lottery. So here you can see uh, someone has a question. No, I think it was just, uh, okay. just a noise. So, sound. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, um, so here you can see, for instance, the effect two years after the lottery, five years after the lottery, and 10 years after the lottery. And um, each point uh, represents the effect in the pooled sample, in the sample of females, and in the sample of males. So what we can see is that for marriage formation, uh, the effect of uh, the lottery is positive two and five years after, uh, after the event. But this effect is driven by only by men. So for women, uh, there is no, no significant effect uh, of the lottery on marriage probability. For marriage dissolution, uh, there are some interesting gender heterogeneities as well. So you can see that um, two years after the lottery, the probability that a couple in which wife uh, was the winner uh, the probability that the, this couple gets divorced uh, increases significantly. But this, effects, this effect fades away uh, when, the, uh, when the event window is extended. Then for men, you can see that in couples where uh, the winner was, um, was a man, the probability that this couple gets divorced decreases uh, five and 10 years after the lottery. So basically it suggests that when the winner is wife, uh, they get divorced. When the winner is husband, uh, it's uh, the, con uh, the contrary. No, the marriage get, get more, uh, gets more sta uh, stable. So for fertility, we have found that um, two years after the lottery, there is a positive, um, statistically significant, but uh, quite not, not really precise effect uh, on the number of children, but again, it is driven only by men. So fertility increases only by men, uh, only um, in, in the sample of men. Uh, five years after the lottery, this effect increases. Again, it's not statistically distinguishable from zero for women. And the same, um, 10 years after the lottery, the effect persists as well uh, in men. So um, just, to, just to comment a little bit on the magnitude of the effect. So the effect of marriage formation um, in men suggests that uh, 1 million Swedish kron, which is about 140,000 US dollars, which, which, this is a lot. This is about six years of annual disposable income in Sweden. It increases the probability of, get, uh, of getting married by three uh, percentage points. So it constitutes about 35 uh, and, and a half percent of the baseline two year uh, marriage probability. So it's quite, quite big. Um, five years after the lottery, the effect constitutes about 29 or 30 percent of uh, baseline marriage probability. And uh, 10 years after the lottery, effect is not longer significant, but you can still see that it's positive and quite big in magnitude. So for marriage dissolution, we found that, uh, as I said, marriage dissolution incre increases, the probability of marriage dissolution increases when the winner is uh, uh, the wife. So when the winner is a wife, uh, two years after the lottery, the probability of marriage dissolution increases by 3.7 percentage points, which almost doubles the baseline uh, divorce probability. So this effect is quite big, but it fades away in the long run. And for men, uh, so for men, uh, the effects on marriage dissolution are marginally significant in the median and in the long run, but when we control for, when we correct for these false discovery uh, rates, uh, it is not statistically distinguishable from zero. Although these effects are quite big as well and negative. So also interesting, uh, just, just a second, I would like to comment that, as I said, we compare these effects to income gradients. Uh, so you can see these results here in this line. 
So basically, it is correlation between income, uh, average annual disposable income, and uh, the probability to get divorced. And you can see that um, for women, this correlation is positive, and for men, this correlation is negative. So it matches uh, our causal effect estimates. And also, we find that um, the differences in effects um, for men and for women are statistically significant. So we reject equal treatment um, uh, hypothesis. And si similarly, these differences are also statistically significant uh, in um, uh, for gradient estimates. So finally, uh, this table shows you the results for fertility. So uh, 1 million Swedish krones or 140,000 US dollars uh, increases the number of children two years after the lottery by 002. Uh, so it's, of course, it seems very small, but when we compare it to the baseline mean, it actually it constitutes 27.2% uh, of the baseline uh, two-year fertility rate. Uh, five years after the lottery, this effect constitutes about 17% of the baseline um, baseline uh, five-year fertility rate, and 10 years after the lottery, this effect constitutes 12.5% uh, of the baseline 10-year um, fertility rate. So just to summarize again our results, uh, 1 million Swedish quants increases uh, the probability that men get married two and five years after the lottery. Uh, these effects are quite big. For divorces, we found that, that when the winner is a wife, the probability that couple get divorced increases uh, two years after the lottery, uh, but the effect uh, fades away uh, in the long run. Um, and when the winner is a, is a husband, it seems that uh, the effect uh, um, marriage, marriage dissolution probability reduces, but we cannot really reject uh, uh, the null hypothesis that this effect is equal to zero. And for fertility, um, higher wealth implies higher number of children, two, five, and 10 years after the lottery. And again, these results are driven by men. So let me- discuss. Sorry, Anastasia, there is a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. uh, they are asking if, uh, do you have any real state controls? Uh, real estate controls, so like controlling for, um, for um, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking like if I get a million dollars, I'll buy myself a house and it's easier for me to get married unless like compared to living in a rented accommodation. So yeah, nice. yeah, this could be possible mechanism. Yeah, right. Yeah, we, we have it actually. So uh, I can show you just, oh no, actually I don't have this plot here. Yeah, but the probability that you get, uh, that you get uh, real assets increases when you win, uh, win the, the lottery. Although we don't know if this is a mechanism that drives uh, the effect or not, but it could be one of the potential mechanisms. Yeah, but we have this data. We don't have it for the whole time period. We have it for a few years. Uh, but yeah, definitely the probability that you get a house increases when you win the lottery. Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. So um, I just wanted to discuss brief briefly what are the potential mechanisms of uh, uh, our results and to compare it um, to the previous uh, to the previous uh, estimates. So. Uh, Higher wealth may increase the probability to find a partner if the probability of match depends on the quality of the searcher and also on the searching pool. So here, um, if higher wealth is indicative about the quality of the searcher, then clearly it might, it might increase the probability that you find a partner. Um, another potential mechanism is that young adults may delay marriage until they reach economic stability. So in fact, uh, this is consistent with our, our finding that only low income men are affected by the lottery. So only for low income men, the probability to get married increases. So it might be that uh, this, uh, this subsample uh, basically is not able to cover, was not able to cover uh, their expenses related to marriage and for that reason, uh, lottery wealth, uh, additional lottery wealth may might push them to get married. 
Um, also, our results are consistent with some previous uh, studies that documented a positive effect of unearned wealth on marriage. Uh, so this paper, for instance, by Schneider, uh, 2011, and uh, Chu, 2020. Uh, but for instance, Schneider, um, 2011, they did not really have exogenous variation in wealth, uh, but they also found that additional wealth increases the probability to get married. And Chu used uh, housing wealth. Um, so regarding these gender differences, so again, I, I remind you that we found that the probability that men get married increases, but for women, we did not find the same effect. So this is consistent with the previous uh, evidence that there is a strong, um, uh, st there is a stronger relationship between income and the probability to get married for men than for women. But here, um, uh, this previous evidence focused on earned income. Um, so these gender differences are also consistent with uh, previous uh, studies that show that men and women may value different qualities when choosing a partner. So basically, this previous uh, literature shown, for instance, this paper by Thies Thiesman, uh, I think it's a quarterly journal of economics. So they uh, ran this uh, speed dating experiment, and they shown that uh, men value more physical attractiveness, and uh, women value more earning potential, intelligence, and social status. So here, if wealth is indicative about social status, it may increase uh, males' value on the marriage market, so increase the probability that they get married. For women, it might not work this, uh, this way, because for them, the important characteristics is uh, physical attractiveness. So for that reason, it might be that uh, higher wealth does not really change uh, the probability that women get married. Um, so next interesting finding is that uh, there is an increase in the short run uh, probability uh, that women uh, get divorced. Not women get divorced, but couples where the winner is a wife get divorced. Um, so this finding is consistent with empirical evidence showing that higher husband's income or employment stabilizes marriages, while wife's income or employment have an opposite effect. So we also found that only financially dependent uh, women um, that are already at higher risk of divorce are affected. So I'm not going to show the table because I, 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 I think I'm already out of time. Well, uh, if you can please wrap up in a couple of minutes, yeah, we'll yeah, have yeah. enough time for discussion, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So basically some heterogeneity analysis shows that only financially dependent women so women who, who earn less than their husbands are affected by, by the lottery. Uh, and this is consistent with um, uh, economic independence hypothesis. So also the fact that estimated uh, effects um, fade away as the event window is extended uh, suggests that unearned wealth matters uh, mostly by accelerating termination of marriages uh, whose dissolution uh, was already underway, uh, and perhaps by providing some uh, economic uh, economic stability uh, to financially dependent uh, women. But this uh, so this explanation is consistent uh, with our results only if the lottery wealth is not split equally after divorce. If lottery wealth is split equally after a divorce, then uh, one potential explanation for our results could be that there are some traditional gender norms, so that there are husband breadwinners norm, and basically higher, um, higher wife's wealth may violate this norm and may destabilize uh, these traditional couples. And the opposite happens when, when, uh, when husband uh, wins the lottery. Uh, up to now, we are not really able to say uh, how wealth is split after a divorce. So Swedish law tells us that uh, the wealth is split equally after a divorce. But if we look at the data, for instance, here you see the differences in spouses wealth before and after a divorce, absolute value of this difference. So if wealth uh, is split equally, we should observe that this difference goes to zero. 
here you can see absolute difference in spouses' net wealth. So you can see that before the divorce um, and after the divorce, so there, there is no there is no discontinuity after a divorce. So it seems that the difference doesn't go to zero. So basically the empirical results are not really indicative uh, that wealth is split equally after divorce. Therefore, we are not really sure about the mechanisms, but there are these two potential explanations. All right, so I can conclude now. So in this- Excellent. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Uh, Anastasia, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you've covered a lot of ground, and I'm sure almost everyone has something to say about these matters. Not mm -hmm. necessarily about lottery winning, but uh, the implication thereof. So please, the floor is open for discussion. Are there any questions or comments to Anastasia's paper? Uh, let me start, uh, as almost mm -hmm. always. Uh, yes, well, I, I'm quite... Uh, interested by the results and uh, well I don't know if it's uh, politically correct to say but uh, it seems that the well as also as you pointed out in a couple of slides ago like it seems that the women are more interested about financial stability and therefore like when yeah like if the man uh, gets the price they become more attractive and uh, mm -hmm. when they get the price and they are married they just walk away mm -hmm. um, is there like any other possible mechanism that uh, have you considered that could uh, explain this difference uh, by gender? And yeah, then I yeah. have another question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so another mechanism, as I said, could be uh, traditional gender norms. So basically, uh, if women get uh, the wealth, then it basically husband may just simply not like it because uh, uh, there is a norm that husband is a breadwinner and he should get more wealth than the wife. I mean, I'm not sure about this mechanism because this is just a lottery, you know, so this is just luck. It's not really indicative about ability of the, of, of the wife. It's not really indicative about earning capacity of the wife. But still, it could be one potential explanation. I mean, it is also consistent with uh, previous literature about earnings. Um, yeah. Okay. And my second question is about fertility, because well, mm -hmm. uh, you pointed out that in the case of divorce, like uh, it's it's plausible that the uh, like uh, it can increase the rate of divorce. But if the couple is already kind of in an unstable situation and basically like winning the lottery speed up the process. Uh, so could be something similar with fertility because I mean I, I don't think that a, a couple like say that they're like not thinking about having children and then like one of them gets their the price and this oh like let's start having children so do you think it, it's mostly about accelerating this process or do you think that maybe some couples will change uh, of mind uh, uh, because more children I think this uh, mm, so yeah so we try to estimate also this. Uh, um, duration model to check if this is more about accelerating um, accelerating fertility decision. So it seems that there are both things going on. So uh, it seems that completed fertility increases and also that uh, um, they they start having children early, perhaps. Yeah, so mechanisms. Yeah. Okay. And there are a couple of questions in the chat. Right. Uh, there is a good one from Sergei Popov. Here there is a selection bias in your sample. That yes, uh, people who play some, lottery but, there might mm -hmm. be slightly different from the general population. Yeah. yeah, lottery players are different from the general population. No, is that a problem? Yes. So here, uh, let me go back to this slide about external validity. Yes. So you are completely right, and uh, this is a concern, of course, that uh, lottery players might not be representative of uh, general population. So, uh, as I mentioned, first thing that we have checked is how different are the lottery players from the representative population. Uh, so here you can see that, of course, there are some differences like uh, in, in number of children in education, but it's not, it's not dramatic. So it's not like uh, uh, they are low income or, um, or low educated. And also uh, previous literature, so not, not, um, not studies based on the same data as our paper, but also uh, some studies based on uh, lottery winners from the US, they found that yes, lottery winners are um, have slightly um, are slightly older 
uh, men are overrepresented among lottery winners, uh, but um, the differences are again are not dramatic. And uh, uh, for instance, it does not seem that lottery wealth is spended differently from the other sources of wealth. So we don't really have um, a lot of uh, reason to be worried about it, but you're completely right. This is one of the limitations of these lottery studies. So one thing that we can do and we are thinking to do is perhaps uh, to reweight the sample. So in order to match, um, in order to match the distribution of uh, controls uh, in the representative sample so that uh, for instance, average age, average uh, um, share of females, uh, average income in our lottery sample is uh, similar to the representative sample and see if the effect uh, uh, remains uh, in this related sample. It could be one of the solutions. Still something in progress. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. It's a good point. Uh, another question from Elena. Uh, how sample of lottery winners differ from, well, that's the uh, same question, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, that Sergey asked. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I think Let, let's see if uh, if there are any further questions or comments to to Anastasia's paper. Uh, there was a an, an old US movie. I'm not sure if you watched it. Uh, it's uh, Nicolas Cage was starring, <clears throat> titled <clears throat> "It Could Happen to You." If you haven't seen it, look it up because it's precisely the case of your study. There is right. a cop in, in New York City, I think, and the family wins a lottery, a big one. Mm -hmm. And lots of things happen that could be. On a more serious note, though, my question is, uh, uh, your, uh, your sample is from Sweden. <clears throat> and uh, Sweden is not a typical country, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, in Sweden, probably 50% of the household are not officially married. And uh, my question is if that is taken care of in your study. Uh, they live together, they are spouses, but uh, they're not married, so are they included? And uh, the second one that many people in Sweden, and that was actually a big story in, in the media uh, several years ago, prefer to stay unmarried and not to have children. So these are typical features of the modern Swedish society, and the question is to what extent you think it might have affected your findings? Yeah. And uh, and uh, next step is, is there any chance to compare Sweden with some other countries and see how the results are robust, uh, not yeah. driven entirely by? <clears throat> or in general, it's surprising because Sweden is a very modern society, a great deal of gender equality. Uh, and still, uh, you show that this old good <laughs> sort yeah. of stereotypical features of uh, husband and wife, men and women still hold in Sweden. So. It yeah. might be interesting to see if you can do something similar with uh, with a country of slightly different cultural uh, format. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your questions. Uh, so, first of all, about comparing our results to different country, it would be, I think, very difficult because this data is very unique. And I mean, we could compare perhaps using some different um, some different identification strategy, or maybe we could compare uh, income. Uh, income gradients, so correlations between income, marital, and fertility outcomes. But of course, estimate something similar using the lottery data from our from other countries would be difficult because um, our sample is very unique. So my co-authors co collected the, this data uh, some years ago uh, by themselves, and um, it's it's really unique data because it collects like information almost on all lottery players in in Sweden. So it would be it would be difficult. Regarding, uh, but we could try to compare correlations, perhaps showing whether the correlations between income and uh, and um, and these outcomes are similar uh, in Sweden to uh, to other countries. How different Sweden from other countries? Yes, of course. Yeah, as as any other country is different from the entire uh, population, right? Uh, for instance, Sweden is not really different from other Nordic countries. So let me open, for instance, this plot for fertility. So here you can see uh, fertility in Sweden, fertility in uh, in uh, Finland, in Norway. So it's not like it's completely different. Now, for instance, average number of children in Sweden, in Norway, in the US are quite similar. Um, so I'm not sure how much we should be worried about it. But about what you said, that it's not really common in Sweden to get married, this is a very good point. That's true. So. 
we have, first of all, we include people who are cohabiting, of course, and we also tried to see whether there is some effect on the probability to, to start cohabiting with, something, with someone. And we didn't really find any significant effect on the probability to cohabit. So this could be, um, the explanation could be that the effect on marriage is driven by, um, by these marriage costs. So people basically are more able to, to cover these marriage costs when they get uh, a lottery. Um, and yes, the, about 50% of children in Sweden are born outside marriage. For, for that reason, when we, when we run our, um, our analysis for fertility, we include married and um, unmarried individuals. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, anything further, please? Any further questions to uh, Anastasia? I, I don't see any. Well, um, I think it was a very good exercise, uh, this whole idea of Gary Becker of applying uh, rational uh, arguments to decisions to marry, to have children, I think. They helped a great deal, and we've learned a lot from this paper. And I must say, thanks very much for presenting it. <laughs> Thank you it. so much for inviting me and for you. And uh, hopefully, there will be a chance for us to see if for you to visit our yeah, university okay. when COVID is over. Uh, now, before before we uh, part, Bernardo, please conventionally, what's next? Yes, well, uh, thanks, Anastasia, for accepting the invitation. Was uh, we were very happy to to have you today. Um, well, for next week, uh, we will have a uh, Christopher Parsons from the University of Western Australia, and he will be presenting his paper, about, uh, which is titled For FARC's Sake, uh, Demobilizing the Oldest uh, Guerrilla in Modern History. So this is about the FARC's in the guerrilla in Colombia. So, well, as about, uh, can you repeat that again, please? Yes, it's about the, I don't know how to say it in English, but this is uh, the, the main guerrilla, guerrilla in Colombia. Yeah, the FARC, yes. Uh, so in the chat, and it's about like oh, demobilizing, far, far. Yeah, far. Okay, right. it's about okay, demobilizing yeah. them. Uh, so the, that's yeah. the paper, uh, same place, same time. So we hope to have you all next Thursday. So well, have a good evening and a good week, everyone. Okay, thanks very much. Salute. Thank Stay you so safe. much for inviting me. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.